Welcome to the Manitowish Waters Historical Society's interview with retired forester Ralph Hewitt. Ralph worked at the Trout Lake Ranger Station and actually lived on the grounds for 10 years. Early on in 1911, E.M. Griffith, the first state forester, created a model for the Wisconsin Forest Reserve. Trout Lake was the headquarters right here in the middle of the forest reserve, as you see in the key below. Also, several ranger stations at Rest Lake, Boulder Junction, Saner, Little Car Lake, and then later one on Star Lake will be created as satellites to help with fire protection and delivering services to the foresters. Trout Lake was definitely the headquarters. Here is the showcase building of the headquarters for the State Board of Forestry. Uh, it was also uh, the headquarters for a field school to uh, train forest rangers. Here are uh, the locations of those first ranger cabins that networked with Trout Lake. The campus of Trout Lake really began to boom about 1910 and building continued for some years, adding a nursery, uh, adding many buildings, um, garages, support systems. It became its own community and it was a robust time through about 1915. From 1933 to 1939, another big build went on at Trout Lake. This was ushered in by Civilian Conservation Corps enrollees that were um, stationed at Star Lake CCC Camp or Camp Crystal Lake on White Sand Lake in Boulder Junction. Here they made the cement blocks. They built this dorm, which is now the office uh, for the Trout Lake Ranger Station and many other support buildings for maintenance and shops and alike. Finally, in 1962, when Ralph Hewitt arrived, Trout Lake was still a robust community and a showpiece for the entire state. Soon, the nursery will migrate off the grounds, but the grounds of Trout Lake still were the home for many Wisconsin Conservation Commission employees protecting the North Woods resources. We hope you enjoy insights from Ralph Hewitt about this great North Woods legacy and protecting our natural resources. Welcome, and we're excited to hear a little bit about Ralph's experiences in the North Woods and how he as a forester really made a difference for so many people and projects. So Ralph, welcome. Thank you. And I guess, can you give us a little background on yourself and how you got to Boulder Junction? <laughs> well, I got to Boulder Junction via uh, going to college at uh, Michigan Technological University in Houghton, Michigan. I spent four years there and got a Bachelor of Science degree in forestry. And I interviewed for a position with the State of Wisconsin Conservation Department, uh, which it was before the DNR, and uh, was fortunate enough to land a position at Trout Lake. And um, it was a fabulous 35-plus year gig, and uh, I enjoyed a lot of it. What was your first year on Trout Lake? First year on Trout Lake was in 1962, and I came there bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, with a lunchbox in one hand and a pair of boots on, and they greeted me with a paint gun, and we went out and we marked a stand of jack pine. <laughs> a great start to a career. And um, you actually lived on the Trout Lake campus for a number of years with a lot of other foresters, rangers, and Wisconsin conservation personnel. Yeah, I was very fortunate. Uh, I initially lived in Boulder Junction in the town for the first three years that I was employed. And then uh, a house on Trout Lake, which was a state-owned house and 
uh, occupied by state personnel, that house opened up. And um, Floyd Reineman, my boss at the time, said, would you be interested in living there? And well, it took me about two seconds to figure out whether or not I'd want to live at Trout Lake. And uh, it, it was just a fantastic place to live. I mean, you were right there under those huge, big white and red pine, and um, the house was all paneled with knotty pine, so it was pretty woodsy, had a fireplace, and uh, my wife and I were just ecstatic uh, to have that location. And then we could look out the front window and see Trout Lake, and it doesn't get any better than that. So what was it like to live with a community of uh, forest rangers and Wisconsin Conservation Commission uh, employees out on Trout Lake. Tell us some stories and give us some idea of how it was like. Well, living at Trout Lake uh, right on the grounds was a real advantage because I could walk to work in the morning and my wife could have the car all day. And so that was a real, real plus. But it was just the ambience of the location that was so fantastic. And my boss, Floyd Reiterman, lived right alongside of me. So I had to behave all the time. <laughs> and then uh, for on, further on up the road was uh, Ben Bendrick. He was our warden out of Trout Lake. And uh, then there was uh, Cliff Lashua. He was our sign painter. He lived in there. And uh, then there was Don Aiken. He was our uh, clerk one of our clerks at Trout Lake Station. And uh, we had just a real good group of people there. And um, it was really fun. And uh, we had a few good times. We had uh, uh, volleyball games and, you know, outings where you ate too much. And, and the only downside was that we were in the public's eye 100%. Uh, and it was not unusual to have the public drive right up to your doorstep and say, hey, you know, it's it's a Sunday afternoon and you're standing there with a, a spatula cooking hamburgers and a martini in the other hand, and they want a fishing license. <laughs> and, uh, well, you, you you can't deny them. You, you have to take care of them. And uh, that, was, that was a very small negative for that whole process. Well, it sounds like you had a, a spirit of service and a lot of camaraderie with uh, your fellow co-workers. Um, just a just a good time. What are some of the things that you did for work right on the campus around Big Trout Lake? Well, Trout Lake itself had the two campgrounds, and we had North, South, and, and South Trout campgrounds, and we, of course, serviced those, and we collected fees and that type of thing. Um, but there was, you know, just the grounds of Trout Lake with all the buildings that were there, that was a big deal. Uh, we had our office, of course, and um, there was what they called the dormitory where people had lived there that had worked. You have to remember years ago that um, there was no place to stay in Boulder Junction. Um, so they built a dormitory for people to work there. And then we had the shop buildings, and it was a just a great facility. We even had a blacksmith shop uh, in the one building and, uh, of course, mechanical for uh, lifting vehicles and servicing them and fixing them because uh, you just didn't have anywhere to run to right away. A lot of those buildings were CCC constructed buildings, am I correct? That was, um, as I remember, and I had heard a rumor at one time that even the blocks had been constructed by the CCCs, and the camp was located on the uh, west side of uh, Big Sand Lake, uh, just west of Boulder Junction. Yeah, that's Camp Crystal Lake on White Sand Lake, which is its own story. Okay, but, very good. Uh, yeah, they made their own blocks. You're correct with that. Um, and then there is this great log building that E.M. Griffith started construction about 1911. They finished it. Uh, some years later, that was still standing when you were working, correct? Yes, it was still standing, and it was the most gorgeous building. Uh, the architecture was, as I had heard, was from the old German uh, style of construction, and it had uh, just a more gorgeous fireplace in it. It had a big kitchen, 
uh, because at one time people stayed there just like a hotel. And uh, they had a cookhouse and a wash house, and which was partially taken down by the time I got there. But uh, Paul Brenner, who uh, was one of our surveying people, uh, gave us some history and background on that. And um, when they tore that building down, I had tears in my eyes. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people did. And um, the notion that it had to come down came from it not being very stable or it was some kind of an architectural problem. Is that correct? I, well, what we had heard is they brought engineers up from Madison and uh, they bored a couple of the uh, bottom half logs and they said, oh, these are rotten and it's no good and the building should come down. And then when I saw the building being tore down, it was just the bottom half logs that needed replacing. And uh, that was not a happy day. <laughs> we lost a cultural treasure with those decisions. Yeah, yeah, my dream personally was to turn it into a visitor center. I thought with all the rooms and the uh, fireplace and everything, how much perfect it could have been. But, uh, well, sometimes dreams don't come true. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I had a story shared with a uh, young ranger who was here when it was taken down that a, a D9 bulldozer chained up to the supports inside the, the building and it was going to yank the building down and the building stood and the bulldozer stalled. Not surprising to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it, uh, it's, a, it's a legacy that we unfortunately no longer uh, have with us, but it's certainly worth documenting, and thank you for your insights. Um, other uh, areas out there would also be the nursery, correct? Correct. Okay. Talk to us a little bit about uh, the nursery when you were there. It was just before it was moved, right? Right. I came in 1962. And uh, the nursery was in full uh, going at that time. But uh, it was only a couple of years after that they shut it down. And uh, I think they were depending on the larger nurseries in the southern part of the state, growing season and a bunch of other uh, bits of technicalities that they felt were better to close it down. And uh, so I really didn't get in on that operation. And uh, but... Uh, we still had, uh, like the cooling facility, which was a real blessing from the standpoint that we were planting 200 to 300,000 trees per year. And to keep them fresh and ready to plant, we had the old nursery cooling system, and that was a real plus. That's, uh, that's real interesting because that nursery uh, was completed in 1911. Right. And uh, E.M. Griffith, who was the first forester, wanted to show progress of uh, the Department of Forestry um, that he led up. And they brought in a bunch of, well, we would call them invasive species now, but <laughs> seeds from Europe and uh, for scotch pines. Do you want to talk about the scotch pines and your dealing with them? Well, uh, scotch pine, as uh, history told us anyway, was wanting to show a, quickly a result of, of the nursery product. And when uh, Fred Wilson created the Star Lake Plantation, he also wanted to show a quick result of the planting. And so they planted scotch pine in front of the um, site that they had chosen for, um, uh, they used it for an experimental plot in a demonstration. I think Fred re referred to it as a demonstration forest. So those big scotch pine are still there. <laughs> and they're scattered around the North Woods. You can still find them. That they are. Yeah, yeah. Um, thinking about living on Trout Lake and working on Trout Lake, um, you shared some memories. Uh, one was of Don Halverson, and uh, could you speak a little bit about him? Sure. It, it, originally, the uh, Trout Lake Point had been subdivided into lots that the state had thought that they were going to lease. And Don Halverson was right on the cutting edge at that lease. As far as I know, 
He was the only one that received one of those leases. And he built this beautiful log cabin on Trout Lake. And, and Don was uh, the, just a friendly, great, talented guy. And he introduced himself into the state forest operation periodically and uh, was uh, available for advice. And uh, we just enjoyed his company when... Uh, we were living there at Trout Lake. Don would call my wife and I up every once in a while. They'd say, hey, how would you like to go out to dinner today? And, uh, well, sure. How could we do that? But the real upside was that Don would talk historically about the trip getting up to Trout Lake and getting to the cabin and feeding guests and that type of thing. And uh, we just enjoyed it immensely. And uh, we had a lot of fun because Don would be Santa Claus for our kids at Christmas time. Oh and, uh, but every superintendent uh, that worked at Trout Lake, they all had dealings with Don and uh, they would talk business with him. And uh, he was a great addition and it broke our heart when he had to move his cabin off and um, he was no longer there. Of course, he was in his 90s by that time. And um, my fond memory of Don was, he asked me, he says, could you find me a, few trees to plant. I said, well, what kind do you want? He said, well, red pine would be good. I said, okay, how many do you want? Well, a half a dozen would be good. Well, out of 200,000, I could find <laughs> a few trees for Don to plant. And I thought, man, this is a guy in his 90s, and he's planting trees. And I have trouble talking some young people planting trees because they're so small. Mm -hmm. And by the time Don passed away, those trees were almost 20 feet tall. <laughs> well, that's a great story and uh, about a, a, a great um, resident on, on right. Big Trout Lake. You told me about him taking guests out to hand line for lake trout off of Cathedral Point. Sure. Well, you know, sometimes guests would drop in and Dom wouldn't have uh, the ability to feed them all. He didn't. And of course, remember the old refrigerators, there wasn't much storage in those freezers. So he would get in the canoe with a hand line and a spoon tied to it, paddle up and down the narrows of Trout Lake, and that provided dinner. <laughs> very good. And um, I'm sure those guests were uh, very pleased with the, uh, the fresh trout at that time. Can you recall other special memories or events that took place out on Trout Lake? Uh, well, I think the interesting part of living there was uh, having all the talented people in one place. And uh, having the warden right there was a real plus because we would get phone calls all the time needing help and he was right there. You could knock on his door and say, hey Ben, you know, we got this call, can you go? And he would. And the same with uh, Floyd Reinemann, he was the superintendent and any major issues he could take care of right there. And uh, uh, Cliff Lanchua, he was our sign painter and uh, just a talented, talented fella. And he painted the majority of our signs by hand and they were just beautifully done. And uh, he, was, he was a very fun guy to talk to. <clears throat> All righty. So as a young forester around 1962, your tenure at... Uh, at Trout Lake coincided with the development of the Youth Conservation Corps created by Gaylord Nelson, right. Wisconsin governor, to kind of create a CCC summer experience exclusively for high school aged, initially young men, but ultimately men and women. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the YCC and what you experienced as the supervisor here for Statehouse right. Lake? Well, the YCC camp was a real blessing to our state forest because we got a lot of hand work from high school kids. And you take 100 high school kids and you can get a lot of work done. And uh, they were wonderful at cleaning up beaches. You line a hundred high school kids up on a beach, when they walk from one end to the other, it's clean and it's done. But it was a great opportunity to give kid, kids an opportunity to have hands-on work. 
and they got blisters and bit by mosquitoes and wood ticks and, and sweat running down their nose. And uh, it was so much fun to watch them develop from the time that they got to camp to the time they left. And uh, there were a, quite a number of them didn't want to leave. But uh, we missed them when they closed the camp down uh, because they, they worked, uh, did a lot of plantation release. That means that they took away um, species of trees around our planted trees, such as aspen saplings, and they would cut them down and but we released those young trees and they grew just that much better. And, and to hire that done was not in the budget of the state forest. So uh, they were a real wonderful addition to our program. Did they? Did you do any trail clearing projects with them? Yes, uh, one of the big ones was the Fallison Lake Nature Trail, and uh, we built stairways down some of the hills, and they cleared, of course, the trail and uh, made it possible for people to walk unimpeded uh, around the entire facility. And Fallison Lake Trail is one of the really finest trails on the state forest, I think. And uh, they they built the whole thing. Did you ever do any work out on Paul Marsh with the YCC boys? Not that I can recall. Uh, it's possible that the game people um, gave them some project to do, but I don't recall any. So you as a forester didn't have complete control and access to the YCC enrollees? Oh, no. No, that was all done... Uh, somewhere through the Madison office. Um, all we did was, when the kids came, our first job was to train them. And uh, seeing as how they were going to be using axes and sharp tools, uh, that was an important part. And uh, I can remember giving that lecture every year and seeing those shiny faces and eager, and they wanted to cut with those axes. <laughs> <laughs> But your colleagues in fisheries and game management and other elements of the Wisconsin Conservation Commission and ultimately the DNR also utilized the Youth Conservation Corps boys from Wisconsin. Yes, they, they, I'm sure they did. But uh, I didn't get involved in any of those projects and, uh, because we were more tied into the state for it. So um, the next thing that I want to talk about um, uh, with the YCC program, uh, we have a great picture of Paul Brenner, who was uh, at a YCC site as the DNR um, liaison, guiding a YCC counselor in doing work. Paul Brenner was just a wonderful employee and a a neat guy to be around and very, very knowledgeable. And Paul worked on our survey uh, crew. Uh, the state force wanted to recover and develop all of the lost lines of ownership on the state forest, and that was what he was involved in. He uh, also uh, served in other capacities. For example, the picture you've got of Paul, I'm sure he was directing one of the counselors in uh, probably a release project. And um, the one thing about uh, the early years of working at Trout Lake is we did everything. I mean, no matter what your particular job description said, it was not unusual for the boss to come out and say, hey, we need somebody to do this. Could you take charge of it? And, uh, and that was the fun part of those early years. Uh, you never knew from one day to the next whether you'd be shingling a outhouse or whether you'd be marking timber or um, maybe taking care of a logger in his project. So it was, it was a fun time. That really is a nice lead into my next question. There's a balance in your work. You're professionally trained as a forester, but you did a lot of recreational work and to facilitate uh, recreational experiences for visitors to the Northern Highland uh, Forest now the Northern Highland American Legion Forest. Uh, can you talk about that balance between forestry and recreation a bit? Uh, that was a very important part of the job that we did, was to balance the recreation and the timber management. Uh, timber management is a very aggressive part of uh, 
the action that takes place on the forest. And uh, if you cut a tree down in your backyard, you make a mess. But we cut a lot of them down. And uh, as our visitors would come every summer, we tried to balance um, the cutting operations with the aesthetics that they would experience. And this was a, a big challenge. Uh, many of the people that came up to the forest didn't want to see any cutting. But that was our charge, of course. Uh, State Statute 2804 said, thou shall manage the forest for wood products. And uh, we did that. But by the same token, we, we had to observe the aesthetics of our recreation program. And uh, we had trails and campgrounds and all of these other activities going on. And uh, balancing that was uh, a real challenge and uh, a fun part of the work. And we got involved in a lot of that. Uh, in fact, uh, I served as the supervisor for the recreation program for three years. All righty. Um... One of the stories you shared with me you know, the other time that uh, we met together, that you were doing some work around Manitowish waters and you found some abandoned dynamite in the woods. <laughs> yeah, Cully Erickson, uh, my mentor at the time, and I were out uh, taking care of the administration. And uh, uh, what we would do is, at the time, for most of the cut products, we would measure them in the woods and then we would build a contractor accordingly. Well, we saw this old, old ice box out in the one area, one of our timber sales, and uh, well, we had to go take a look. <laughs> so we opened that up and lo and behold, here's a box of dynamite. Well, needless to say, we were all fired up over that and uh, the wildlife uh, people at the time had uh, licensed uh, dynamite users. So we called them up and said, hey, how would you like to carry a box of dynamite? <laughs> and that was no small event because old dynamite is, can be pretty dangerous. So, But we were concerned primarily that some young kids would be prowling around and run into that and get into trouble. And uh, that was uh, <laughs> quite an event. Yeah, it was interesting. Uh, I, I bring that up because I just discovered some research from... Um, the Department of Agriculture and Engineering um, to help clear the land for cutover farmers uh, from about 1919 to 1926. The uh, Wisconsin Ag Engineering Department hired 35 people up in Superior to actually manufacture high explosives and created their own special kind. Right. And what was staggering to me in that short period of time, they manufactured 19 million pounds of dynamite. So it was very, very prevalent early on, and it, it can be so very, very dangerous. Here back at Trout Lake, um, there was a special dynamite magazine that was large and ornate that was built by the CCC boys. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, that building was located a long way from the headquarters, which we were happy about. Uh, we used it primarily for storage. Our wildlife people were the only ones that used dynamite on the state forest at, during my career time anyway. But uh, uh, we uh, stored uh, tree planting bars and odds and ends in that particular building and it slowly deteriorated and fell apart. <laughs> but upon its completion, and we do have an image of it, um, it was really quite a large building, really much bigger, um, John Christensen said in his book, um, than what they needed for dynamite. But I think there was some ambitious architects of the CCC wanting to show off their, their prowess <laughs> in, uh, in masonry work. Um, as we go on, uh, how did the Trout Lake um, Conservation Commission uh, group here work to support the community beyond just forestry and uh, fish and game management practices? Well, early on, uh, the state forest was an integral part of the community. Uh, you had the employees, of course, were part of the community. and. It was very important to us to be accepted and uh, that they would 
uh, cooperate with us. And in turn, the state forest cooperated uh, with the community here in town. And I can remember at one time we had a um, road grader and we built the ballpark uh, for the town. And uh, as time went on, of course, these types of projects were frowned upon by the upper administration people in Madison. But at the time, it was, I think, very important that uh, we got the cooperation from the town and they, in turn, got it from us. And, of course, another big thing was fire control. We needed their expertise, equipment, and manpower to help fight fire. And uh, that's why um, cooperating with each other was very important. So within your tenure, um, tell us about some of the fires that you found to be most interesting. <laughs> Fortunately, uh, the Northern Island American Indian State Forest is, is called the asbestos forest because we had very few fires. And we were blessed with uh, good rainfall throughout the summer, most of the time. And what fires occurred mostly was uh, from the local town dumps. Okay. Because we, they would burn their garbage. That was the, what they did and how they got rid of it. And around those dumps, when that fire would break out, we were called to put it out. It was excruciatingly painful to fight fire because the previous fires, the blackberries got as big as your thumb oh, yeah. <laughs> and about took the pants right off of you. And um, so those were, those were difficult uh, fire control experiences. We also did some prescribed burning at the time, and uh, we got very involved with our fire control people, and uh, they worked uh, quite separately from the uh, other forest activities because oh, they had a big job to do. And uh, when I got to Trout Lake, we had a switchboard, and uh, that switchboard was connected to all of the fire towers, and telephone wires ran through the forest to each tower, and that's how they communicated. And uh, it was a big job. The first thing they would do is plug in a meter tester and find out, okay, do we have a tree down on the line? And uh, they spent a lot of time clearing those lines. And, and then, of course, as radios got um, better and um, able to use those uh, fire um, lines that... Uh, used to connect the phones, disappeared. and uh, But that was a big deal. I'm sure that was uh, busy this time of year right now, which is fire season in yeah. early May. That switchboard and people up in the fire towers, it must have really been bustling. That was interesting to be in the office and to hear the switchboard go off. And our secretary at the time, I can remember when I first arrived there, was a very talented woman. And uh, when the fires were called in, uh, Tower would call in and say, I have a smoke, you know, approximately so many miles away at such and such direction. And she had a big map and she'd look on the map and say, no way, that's not the right distance. Look again. <laughs> she was so talented. Oh, really? <laughs> because we had all the dumps on the map and we also had uh, like uh, the major... Um, sawmill areas and anything that was scheduled to be burned well she had it all on the map and she would keep those guys on their toes <laughs> well that sounds like a great person to have on your team oh she was fantastic <laughs> yeah yeah so did you ever do fire tower watch duty no no that that's a a funny part of my life is after i was hired on as a forester of course i took my family to um Milwaukee to home and to be with the relatives and I had this favorite aunt called my aunt was Aunt Tilly and Aunt Tilly came up to me and she said oh honey don't you get lonely in that tower <laughs> <laughs> I never spent 10 minutes in a, a fire tower as a, as a forester so uh, but uh, that sticks in my mind yeah but you know since the inception of uh, the Trout Lake Forestry Headquarters for the whole state where you lived for 10 years, uh, fire towers, telephone lines, fire lanes, 
better roads. This has all been part of the model of first the Department of Forestry, then the Wisconsin Conservation Commission, and even the DNR today. So um, the fact that we're the asbestos force is because there's been a lot of effort to fire prevention. Right. Yeah, it, uh, the fellows uh, worked hard and we had uh, to hire people to climb those towers and stay in them all summer long. And they were an integral part of the forest. And well, we all kept a hard hat handy because when the fire siren went off, everybody ran. <laughs> right, well, very, very good. Um, were there any um, calamities or misadventures that stick out from uh, your time as a forester? Well, one of the big ones, of course, was the tornado that went through the Lake Tomahawk area. Mm -hmm. And uh, okay, now all of these down trees, uh, we wanted to get them up off the ground and uh, salvage the trees, plus uh, prevent any type of pathogen investment that might take place. And uh, uh, that was a scary part because you couldn't walk through it. There was no way that you could send foresters in that dangerous area to cruise timber, so to speak. So we did it all from the database that we had developed from the reconnaissance work that we did. Was that the tornado from the mid to late 1970s that you're yes. speaking of? Right. Yes. Yeah, that was, and periodically we'd have rainstorm or a, thunderstorms or downpours or that type of thing that we had to clean up. But um, that was the majority of the problems that we would have with the weather. All righty. And they, they continue, I guess, two years ago, uh, yep. the campsite on Star Lake got hit very, very hard. And I was there last year for that cleanup. But, you know, the forest will grow back. That's true. You know, the, the forest is in incredibly resilient and we always when we were managing for aspen of course that required clear cutting and get the sun to the forest floor to get the new regeneration established and that was a tough sell to the public <laughs> yeah they like those uh, big trees and those nice canopies all right. the time and uh, the the truth of the matter is except for state natural areas or preserves all the forests will be cut within a cycle of time because from the very inception, we are a multi-use forest. There is the recreational piece, but certainly timber harvest is um, just as big. Yes, it, it, it really, uh, one of the difficult things in our forestry program was to try to maintain uh, an, enough manpower to set up the, the timber harvest areas that needed to be set up. And uh, we struggled with that. And uh, especially from the point that on the state forest, we were very concerned with quality work. And we wanted to do the best possible job we could. And that takes time. And it takes manpower to do that. And uh, we were always pretty proud of the results we had with our timber harvest program. <laughs> um, well, if you have uh, any other things you'd like to share uh, from your time as a forester or our focus on Trout Lake, um, please, you know, let us hear it. Well, one of the interesting things when I was first employed, uh, the way you set up timber sales, we'd gather the troops around and everybody would say, well, okay, we got to set up some timber sales. Or where should we go? And of course, this person would mention this stand and that person would know of another stand. And uh, that was really kind of a crazy way to manage a forest. And uh, some very talented men, uh, Chuck Rick and Jim Hoven, they developed a reconnaissance system. The forest was divided into compartments and every compartment was, the stands were identified through aerial photographs. And uh, on the Northern Highland, we were given the choice, uh, okay, do you want to gather the data yourself or should we bring people from the outside in? And we said, no, we'd rather do it ourselves. We want to learn our property uh, as best we can. And so for three years, we did forest reconnaissance. And uh, that's why I 
always claimed that I had walked over at least 30% of the forest on foot. <laughs> and uh, in, when you began, measuring these different plots for management was quite challenging, but didn't you get some new technology that helped you out? Well, the, the thing that uh, really helped us a lot as we developed a technique is using a, what we call the bitter lick stick for cruising. And that allowed us to cruise the timber very rapidly and uh, then, of course, increment bores got better and better, so you could determine the age of different stands because you had to identify every stand within each compartment, and it was a separate unit. And the attempt on, of the program was you have to know what you've got and where it is if you're going to manage it, and that program provided that. And uh, now uh, the next big thing that has been added to the program is the habitat analysis and uh, identification. And this ties into the soil types of the forest and has been a great, great asset uh, to management and it allows us to develop a program of, you know, what we have, where it is. Uh, we also can determine uh, a plan and where, what are we gonna grow in this area? And then secondly, how are we going to do it? And uh, that was the challenge of the profession. <laughs> you saw a lot of evolution regarding forestry during your time here. Oh, yes. And there, well, even now, I've been retired uh, over 20 years, and I see activity occurring in parts of the forest. I go, well, why are they in there? Then I realize it's, I've been gone 20 years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that happens as we retire, doesn't That's it? That's true. Yeah, it keeps, it keeps moving forward. Well, the, this has been just so wonderful, Ralph, and I appreciate you taking time to share and talk with us, and um, I may come back and follow up one more time with you, um, but wishing you the best. Happy to help you. <laughs>